So I'm delighted to introduce Mona Charon. First, I thought it'd be very easy to uh, get people interested because her book has the word sex in it, and that's always somewhat interesting. But it's uh, it's really a great a great book. And what I found fascinating is anyone who's ever known authors or been an author, you have to start your research many years in advance before the book is is published. And there's no way I don't think she could have known about Harvey Weinstein and what else is going on. But this was is not a fad. Mona has been interested in this topic of families and women and sex roles and how we're the same, how we're different for a very long time. Back in 1983, she published an article called The Feminist Mistake. So back in 1983, I already had an inkling of what was going to happen and, and what we're having today. And you're going to hear a, a great, great presentation tonight. So I'm really happy for all of you. Mona is a syndicated columnist, as so a column that appears once a week in various papers. She's a senior fellow of the Ethics and Public Policy Center in DC, and uh, is also the author of a, a book that's a uh, a little older now, but also great, called Useful Idiots, that I, and you can imagine what, what that's about. So uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mona Charon. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you all. Can you hear me all right? Excellent. Uh, I want to thank Erica and John Amirati, my good friends that I met many years ago on National Review Cruises where we bonded. Um, and uh, it's always great to be able to catch up with them. And uh, I'm delighted to be here in Silicon Valley, though I never thought I'd be here addressing a group of conservatives, but um, <laughs> hooray. Um, so my new book is called Sex Matters, as you heard, and um, the day after it was published, the following headline appeared in the Huffington Post. Quote, there's a chilling new call for women to reject feminism. We must fight it at all costs, unquote. In the attached article, the author wrote that watching me on TV was enough to convince him that someone had changed the channel to The Handmaid's Tale. What followed was a 700-word screed about me and my supposed calm invitation to, for women to accept perpetual slavery. But here's my favorite part. He wrote, I admit I haven't read Sharon's new book. <laughs> <laughs> my late father was fond of saying, don't confuse me with the facts, my mind is made up. And, uh, Actually, that's only my second favorite quotation from my father. The, his best line was actually in the form of a question. Why are, they so, why are there so many more horses' asses than there are horses? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I've been doing a lot of interviews since the book was published, but when someone asked me what prompted you to write this book, I didn't have a pithy response ready. I wish I had just said, because I'm happy and I want more people to be able to say that. I have been married for almost 30 years. We have three grown sons. This doesn't make me, and I, sorry, we have three grown sons and I cheerfully cut back on my work while my boys were young. This doesn't make me a freak. It puts me in the mainstream of married women. But we live in an era when fewer and fewer adults are marrying the divorce rate is high, and bitterness between men and women seems to worsen all the time. Lena Dunham, who has built a persona as a spokeswoman for women, wondered how any woman could reject the label feminist. Actually, a 2016 poll found that 68% of American women do reject the label. But her free-floating contempt for men was evident in a recent tweet. She said, I'd honestly rather fall into one million manholes than have one single dude tell me to watch my step. Note the resentment, even when men are attempting to be kind. Dunham is voicing the 21st century version of a slogan that went around in the 1970s. A woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Without denying the beneficial effects of feminism, such as greater opportunities in the workplace and freedom from certain social expectations about what a woman's life must include, we are overdue, I think, for a reckoning about feminism's missteps. 
One of these was what you see in Lena Dunham, stoking this bitterness between men and women. The feminist movement has seeded our culture with myths that badly need debunking. There are many, and I go into them in detail in Sex Matters, but let's itemize some that I discuss. One, that the sexual revolution was necessary and good for women. That masculinity itself is toxic. That all differences between the sexes are socially constructed. That marriage served only men's interests, not women's. And that women earn only 77 cents on the dollar compared with men. Well, <clears throat> the feminist and sexual revolutions that rocked the world 60 years ago have transformed all of our lives. The cultural narrative we're familiar with celebrates the new freedoms and applauds the advances for women. I'll have more to say about those advances in a minute, but first, it's important to ask, are we happier? After 60 years of no-fault divorce, single parenting, hookup culture, and sex in the city, are women more satisfied with their lives? And what about men? Every year since 1972, the General Social Survey has asked a broad cross-section of Americans about their lives in general and how happy they are. In 1972, women reported being somewhat happier than men. Every year since, despite the achievements of feminism, women's reported happiness has declined, both in absolute terms and when compared with men. Around 1990, the sexes passed each other, and since then, women have reported being less happy than men and less happy than their mothers and grandmothers were at the same stage of life. It wasn't one survey either. Dozens of other studies from Europe and America show the same trends. A 2011 study found that women are two and a half times as likely to be taking an antidepressant as men. Recent data on suicide, um, the suicide rates between 2000 and 2016 show a 21% increase for men, but a 50% increase for women. Among middle-aged women, the increase was 60%. So, this closes a gender gap, but not in a way that anyone would cheer. As for men, the decline of marriage and family seems to have left significant numbers adrift. Some 22% of men in their prime ages, that is 25 to 54, are doing no paid work at all. Please note, this category is not the same as unemployed men. These men are not even looking for work. And 14%, only 14% said they were idle because of lack of job opportunities. Most are low skilled, never married, and native born. This cast of men who don't work, don't marry, and don't support children is worrying. Meanwhile, boys and men are falling behind women in many realms of life. Women now earn a majority of bachelors, masters, and PhDs in America. These are among the advances that the feminists cheer, but perhaps we shouldn't be so quick to celebrate. The feminist movement has gotten us into the very bad habit of measuring the success of one sex at the expense of the other. But can women really be considered the winners if men are falling behind? We're all connected to one another. Every one of those men who isn't going to college or isn't employed is some woman's son or brother or father or husband. And speaking of husbands, women tend to marry men who are their equals or superiors in education and income. Who are all those female university graduates going to find to marry? In 2015, and again in 2017, a pair of Princeton economists published data about the declining life expectancy of middle-class Americans. After decades of steadily increasing lifespans due to better nutrition and so forth, um, in the last few years, it's taken a turn in the other direction. Angus Deaton and Anne Case identified the cause as diseases of despair, cirrhosis of the liver, suicide, drug overdoses, and alcohol poisoning. This despair is found in exactly those groups, the lesser educated working class that has seen the most family disruption in the past several decades. So what went wrong? 
how could a doctrine, that is feminism, that merely believes in female equality be responsible for these unhappy trends? Well, you can define anything out of existence. Of course you can define feminism in the most benign way. But if you define it as believing, uh, if you define it as believing in the full legal, social, and moral equality of men and women, who but the most benighted bigot could object? And frequently when I debate feminists, they will define it that way. Well, that may be true for like the suffragettes of the 19th and early 20th century, but it doesn't capture what feminism has been since the 1960s. The feminists that we have come to know excel at sucking the joy out of life. <laughs> the, uh, the second wave feminists were a humorless lot to the point where there was a joke that used to go around, I'm sure you may have heard it, which was, how many feminists does it take to change a light bulb? Answer, that's not funny. <laughs> in 1970, three furious feminist tracks dominated the bestseller list. Kate Millett's Sexual Politics, Germaine Greer's The Female Eunuch, and Shulamith Fi Firestone's The Dialectic of Sex. They and others who comprised what was then called the Women's Lib Movement fulminated against male dominance, endorsed sexual liberation, and demanded that the nuclear family be smashed. In The Female Eunuch, Greer wrote, in the final analysis, women aren't really free until their libidos are recognized as separate entities. Betty Friedan personally invited Robert Rimmer, ah, you may not know, you may not remember Robert Rimmer, there was this enormous bestseller in the 60s, uh, early 70s, called The Harrod Experiment. Yes, yeah, which described a college campus where the students would be assigned to roommates based purely on their computer-generated compatibility, and everybody would have affairs with everybody else, and everybody would be constantly having sex with everyone else, and there would be no jealousy and no marriage, and it would all be blissful and fantastic. And um, okay, so this guy, well, of course, he sold a huge number of books, especially on college campuses. Uh, and uh, but but here's the point I'm trying to bring out. Uh, the National Organization for Women, Betty Friedan's group, and the um, American Association of U uh, University Women sought his advice about the cultural construction of gender roles. Feminists joined hands with libertines like Hugh Hefner. Hefner supported the now Legal Defense and Education Fund. He championed the Equal Rights Amendment, and he filed amicus curiae briefs to the Supreme Court in abortion cases. He said, I was one of the first feminists. Now, without feminism's seal of approval, the sexual revolution would never have gone mainstream. It would have influenced a few nonconformists in Berkeley and Ann Arbor and Manhattan. But most people would have dismissed it as just another attempt by men to get women to let down their guard. Feminism ratified the sexual revolution as pro-woman, but was it? Have a look at what's happening on college campuses. There is an epidemic of accusations of sexual assault. Universities have hired phalanxes of gender-based misconduct specialists and Title IX interpreters. Though the statistics on college sexual assault have been exaggerated, and while some percentage of the accusations seem to arise from regretted sex, the prevalence of such complaints, overwhelmingly filed by women, is a signal that the sexual free-for-all has not turned out to be the egalitarian, lubricious utopia imagined by Robert Rimmer. As several women confided to sociologist Lisa Wade, they had been raised to believe that they had inherited a right to express their sexuality from the women's movement of the 60s and 70s. The reality of, 21st, of the 21st century has proved disappointing. Quote, they didn't feel like equals on the sexual playground, more like jungle gyms. The sexual revolution and the hookup culture it incubated left good men unsure of how to behave and offered bad ones a golden opportunity for abuse and rape. The Me Too movement is another red flag pointing to women's unhappiness with the hookup culture and the sexual, that the sexual and feminist revolutions bequeathed to them. 
You may remember the Aziz Ansari story that made a huge splash a few months ago and prompted a debate about whether Me Too had gone too far. Well, one comment that I found really interesting was from a feminist named Jessica Valenti. She runs a website called feministing.com. And she wrote, a lot of men will read that post about Aziz Ansari and see an everyday reasonable sexual interaction. But part of what women are saying right now is that what the culture considers normal sexual encounters are not working for us, unquote. I actually agree with this. So many of the young women that I spoke to when I was right researching this book told me that they would love to date and to flirt and to form relationships with men, but instead find themselves forced to choose either hooking up or nothing. The feminist explanation for what's gone wrong is that masculinity itself is toxic. We have to teach men not to rape, period, they chant. Their claim is that our culture indoctrinates men to become rapists. This is a slur against men. Look, I wrote a whole chapter in my book about differences between the sexes. It was actually the most fun chapter to write. Uh, and, it's, and I would be the last to deny uh, that there are many, many differences between men and women and that men are by nature more sexually aggressive than women. They are more violent and more promiscuous. But the feminists are trying to catch up. <clears throat> but if our culture really were teaching men to be rapists, we'd have a hard time explaining why rape, along with other violent crimes, has been declining steeply since the 1990s. Moreover, we would have a difficult time explaining why men are so often so self-sacrificing when it comes to women. On the plane out here, I watched the new Clint Eastwood movie, the, maybe it's not that new, but the 1517 to Paris, which uh, documents that famous case in uh, France where there was a terrorist who came out of a bathroom on a train and began firing at people, and uh, six men uh, leaped up and, and took him on. Um, and, uh, Three of them were Americans. Um, look, that kind of self-sacrificing heroism is a classically male thing to do. You cannot talk about men being toxic without recognizing men being honorable and noble and, and brave. Uh, but you won't hear that from feminists. For 60 years, feminists have been preaching the mantra that all sex differences are socially constructed. This reminds me of the George Orwell quote, there are some ideas so absurd that only an intellectual could believe them. <laughs> all of us know from the evidence of our sexes, of our senses rather, particularly if we are parents, that some traits are more pronounced in one sex than the other. We have three sons, which meant that we had to get used to a certain amount of property damage and trips to the emergency room in our house. It meant that I had to endure endless videos of road construction machinery when the boys was, were each about four years old. And it meant that I had to smile as best I could when we went to the zoo and the boys headed straight for the reptile house every time. But in case you don't trust your common sense, there are reams of scientific papers on sex differences. They affect everything from brain organization to susceptibility to disease to responses to drugs. And while of course it's true that socialization affects behavior to some degree, there are certain things that show up so early and are so universally observed that they cannot be said to be anything other than innate. Baby girls, for example, respond more strongly to the sound of a human in distress than baby boys. Four-month-old girls can distinguish photographs of people they know from those they don't, whereas infant boys at the same age usually cannot. Baby boys are more interested than girls in three-dimensional shapes and in blinking lights. Uh, <clears throat> there are many other um, examples. Um, women have a much superior sense of smell um, and, um, and the, the sexes have certain traits. Researchers who study mate preferences across cultures and across continents have found that just by knowing what a person is looking for in a mate, you can identify his or her sex with 90% accuracy. Men want women who are young and beautiful 
and women tend to want men with resources. <laughs> this is true in Bangladesh and Boston and Berlin and Beijing, so it's hard to say it's a matter of culture. Um, it reminds me of the story of a man who decides in his midlife he's getting a little paunchy and so he's going to join a gym to get in better shape and he approaches the manager and he says, you know, I'd like to, you know, work out on some of your machines, maybe lose a little weight. What can you suggest? He said, oh, come on over here to the Stairmaster. This will really get you going, get you sweating. He tries that for a little while. He says, all right, good. That, I like that machine. He said, what, what about, you know, something for my shoulders? I think, you know, it's good men should have nice broad shoulders. Sure, you know, I'll take you over to the weights. And he did that for a while, that machine. And uh, while he was working on the weights, this woman walked in who had beautiful long auburn hair. She was very shapely and just drop dead gorgeous. And everybody was looking at her. So our paunchy middle-aged guy sort of elbows the uh, owner of the place and he says, hey, tell me, do you have a machine here that could make a woman like that interested in a man like me? <laughs> and the manager said, I absolutely do. And he walked him over to the ATM. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, in some cases, it's hard to say what's innate and what's culture. My husband has a t-shirt that reads, my wife says I have two faults. I don't listen and something else. <laughs> <laughs> feminists, <clears throat> so, so feminists fear the science on sex differences because they would prefer an androgynous world, a world in which, as feminist Gail Rubin described it, obligatory sexualities and sex roles are swept away, and one's sexual anatomy is irrelevant to who one is, what one does, and with whom one makes love. Part of that project is to reject the mother-father married family as anachronistic. Kate Millett quoted Frederick Engels with approval, quote, the family must go. In 2012, Katie Royfe, a feminist and mother of two children by different fathers, condemned concerns about single motherhood. If there is anything that currently oppresses the children, it is the idea of the way families are supposed to be. That is what the feminists claim. But alternative families work only for a tiny minority. For most women and children and men, as we're discovering more and more, the traditional family remains the gold standard. Married adults are much happier, healthier, and wealthier than their single, divorced, or widowed contemporaries. And when it comes to children, those raised by their married parents compared with others are just, the differences are off the charts. Now, recent studies about the effects of fatherlessness have revealed that the rise of single parent, which usually means mother-only families, has had even worse consequences for boys than for girls. Father absence in African-American homes leads to more mental health and behavioral problems for boys than it does for girls. Two MIT economists studied brothers and sisters born in Florida between 1992 and 2002. And they found that for the boys, growing up in a home without their fathers meant that they were much less likely to attend college or to be employed when they reached adulthood than their sisters were. They were less ambitious, the boys were talking about, less hopeful, and more likely to get into trouble at school than fatherless girls. So men have a critical role when it comes to raising children, and I go into this in the book. There are special, there's a special elixir that men bring to the job of parenting that is natural to them, and it turns out to be incredibly important for the, for the good development of both sexes, girls who grow up without fathers tend to have more problems of self-esteem or more likely to get pregnant as teenagers. And boys apparently really need that rough housing that fathers do with their little boys when they're young. This, is, this turns out to be incredibly important for boys' development of self-control later in life. Everything is connected. When more boys are growing up without fathers, there are fewer young men who become the kind of adults women want to marry. Educated, employed, non-drug abusing, and not involved with the criminal justice system. <clears throat> Without the grounding of marriage, men become disconnected from society. And women, of course, are worse off after a divorce. 
usually it's the women who suffer a decline in income, not the men. And 40% of American children are now born to single mothers. This rate of non-marital births combined with the nation's high divorce rate means that about half of all American children will now spend part of their childhood in a single parent home. Social scientists across the political spectrum agree that this family chaos is destructive. In 2017, the poverty rate for female-headed families with children was 36.5% compared to 7.5% for families headed by a married couple. Now, I loved being a mother, uh, but I cannot imagine how I would have coped if I had been a single mother. When I say that marriage gives women emotional and financial security, I am often met with scoffing from feminists and others who claim that I want to turn the clock back. But the clock has nothing to do with it. Just consider the situation of most college graduate women in America right now. They tend to follow the same patterns of marriage that their mothers and grandmothers did. They follow what sociologists have called the success sequence. They finish their education, get a job, get married, and have children in that order, and only in that order. And they rarely divorce. So these women commonly choose to work part-time or not at all when their children are young. And tell all the feminists that, uh, that these women, these doctors, lawyers, engineers, business people, are living in 50, in 50 style homes and that this is, this is what uh, turning back the clock means. Look, feminism need not have rejected marriage and family stability to achieve greater market opportunities for women. And I think I'm the first to point this out in this book, that the trend of women entering the paid workforce predated Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique in 1963 and arguably owed more to the shift toward an information economy than to the sisterhood. Between 1940 and 1956, the era that the feminists say we, women were so oppressed, the number of women in the workforce doubled. As sociologist Daniel Bell noted in 1956, women were to be found in nearly every field, from railroad trainmen to baggage handlers to glaziers to auctioneers. <clears throat> It's a great boon that women's professional talents are valued now more than in the past. To the degree that feminism gave women a boost of self-confidence, it can take a bow. But women also want and need the stability and security of marriage and the profound fulfillment of motherhood. In, 19, in 2015, feminist Amanda Market objected that the Republican worldview is one where even basic things like love, connection, and other basic human needs are being reclassified as privileges that should be available only to the wealthy. Well, Market is right that love and connection are key to human flourishing, but she fails to account for feminism's role in putting those things further out of reach. Betty Friedan was one of the only second wave feminist leaders who actually had children. And late in life, she largely recanted her anti-family views. The feminist narrative places an excessive focus on the burdens rather than the pleasures of femininity. So I talk in the book about this stupid 77 cent statistic. This is the Rasputin of statistics. It cannot be killed. You can stab it, you can garret it, you can drown it, can't kill it. So no, women do not earn 77 cents on the dollar compared with men. You only get that number if you compare all the wages of men and compare it to all the wages of women, and that's of course an absurd comparison because you have to compare like with like. So the National Bureau of Economic Research has shown that when you compare young men and women just starting out in their careers who have the same uh, training, education, skills, the wage gap virtually disappears. The reason it shows up later is, surprise, women choose to work less when they start having kids. Married men, by the way, work harder and more ambitiously when they become fathers. Nearly all mainstream treatment of these matters incorporates the assumption that if women are earning less over their lifetimes, they are the losers. Viewing the world this way diminishes the most important parts of life. 
We are not just atomized individuals. You cannot separate women's success from that of the men and children to whom they're attached. If a mother cuts back at work and is then able to help a son struggling with a learning disability or a daughter with a social crisis at school, isn't the whole family happier and healthier? And isn't the whole society? Besides, as gratifying as work can be, most women have jobs, not careers. The number of Americans attending college is growing, but even in 2017, the portion of women with a college degree was still only 34 percent. Is it really progress then to encourage a high school graduate to turn her baby over to some other high, high school graduate so that she can go man a checkout counter? More affluent, and that usually means married mothers uh, who have a choice, prioritize raising children. Throughout the Western world, even in countries like Scandinavia and Israel, I know Scandinavia is a bunch of countries, but you can get past that, <clears throat> and Israel that offer or have offered generous financial inducements to couples to split childcare 50-50, women continue to shoulder the lion's share of caregiving. A 2013 New York Times survey asked, if money were no object and you were free to do whatever you wanted, would you stay at home, work part-time, or work full-time? Among women with children under, 20, under uh, 18, only 27% said work full time. So, and a Pew survey found that among married mothers, and these are the ones with the most choices, 76% preferred part time employment or no work outside the home. Uh, so, what we are witnessing, sadly, is the creation of a caste system in America. Among women high school dropouts, 57% of births are non-marital. That compares with only 9% among college graduates. This is one of the most important factors in our rising inequality. Single mothers cannot afford the luxury of part-time work. They live one illness, one crime, one missed rent payment away from disaster. America holds the dubious distinction of leading the world in chaotic adult relationships. 40% of uh, American children will see their parents' arrangement dissolve by the time they reach their 15th birthday. And 47% will see a new partner enter their home within three years of their parents' separation, which it turns out is very bad for kids. In the old days, they used to talk about wicked stepmothers for obvious reasons. Now the most likely villain to come into a child's life is, is the wicked stepfather. It's not saying they all are, some are wonderful, but children who live with a non-relative who's living with their mother are 50 times as likely to be abused as children living with their own biological parents. Perhaps due to feminism or attachment to the sexual revolution or the deep-seated American reverence for freedom, we are reluctant to confront the price of neglecting duty and commitment. Too many in our society encourage us to believe that our identity and validation must come almost entirely from our profession. Let me speak for myself. My own work at its best has been stimulating and very gratifying. But my husband and three sons are the treasures of my heart. Given a little luck, most of us can expect to live long lives. There is time enough for raising a family and pursuing a career. But grown-ups must acknowledge that there are always trade-offs. The world will never shower the kind of adulation upon good mothers and fathers that it reserves for successful entrepreneurs, athletes, or reality TV stars. But young people making choices about their futures should know that getting their personal lives right is far more important than career choices. One more thing. Serving, serving others is a privilege that calls forth our best selves. When I was caring for my children, even at moments of highest stress, and there were many, I felt a deep sense that this was where I belonged. For me, and I believe for others, giving, not having, is the key to happiness and peace. Thank you. So, um, one question here is that if you look at a couple of organizations that are expressly female, 
uh, the American Association of University Women and League of Women Voters, they're very much to the left and yet they're given this patina of we're neutral, we're middle of the road, no we don't. Is there anything to, we could perhaps do to expose them or reduce their influence or do something on the other side because that seems to be a very, two very prestigious groups that are not in the middle or show both sides? Yeah, it's, it's true and um, I would just say that the um that there's a little bit of timidity on the part of conservative women that I've noticed where they say, of course I'm a feminist, but, or, you know, yes, I'm a feminist. And, and that gives them too much power, I think. It's better to say, if, yeah, do I believe in women's equality? Absolutely, 100%. But am I, fem am I a feminist? No, because of what the feminist movement has done. And it does, to cite those statistics about the, the majority of American women reject the label feminist. Does that mean they reject equality? Obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously not. Thank you. So without getting too deep into this, this is a great question, how could it not be on a lot of people's minds? Could you comment just a little bit more on the Me Too movement? So the Me Too movement is being portrayed as a, another step in the feminist uh, movement. And I think that's a misinterpretation. Um, my interpretation of the Me Too movement is that it is a um, long delayed, but nevertheless real, um, rebellion against the sexual revolution and what came before. Women are saying, we are tired of being pawed and, mis and abused and of men assuming that sex was, you know, just part of the deal when I hire you as an assistant or whatever else. Um, the notion that, I mean, Hollywood is always played by its own rules, but honestly, the notion that anybody thought he could get away with and did get away with it for years, asking women to come to his hotel room for a business meeting, uh, no. You know, it, the women have been denied the tools to reject men's um, advances, right? And to do it in a way that was just understood. Um, as I was saying with my friend and colleague, Jay Nordlinger, when we discussed my book in our podcast, you know, in the old days when there was social support for women um, keeping their distance and forcing men to behave like gentlemen, um, if a man made a pass at a woman, she could say, well, no. Uh, she could give a lot of reasons. I'm not that kind of girl. Uh, my parents wouldn't like it. You know, my boyfriend wouldn't like. Well, you can still say that, <laughs> but um, you know, it, it, it would. I don't want to get a reputation. She could say any of those things. Now, what can she say? She she's worried that she's going to insult him, that it's going to be seen as some sort of a personal rejection of him, rather than just an inappropriate request. And so it has made it harder for women to navigate this. A lot of them will ask, um, how do I turn someone down without hurting their feelings? And it's, it's gotten really, really difficult for them. Honestly, all right, this makes me feel old, but I'll tell you this story uh, real quick. Sure. College campus, they went and they did a survey, okay? Um, which anybody, uh, frankly, anybody would know this who has any common sense but anyway they did this experiment they took an attractive young woman and an attractive young man who were you know conspirators in the experiment and gave them a clipboard and put them out on a college campus <laughs> and the the attractive young man approached women and said um, a, a variety of things would you go out with me um, would you go have sex with me tonight um, or and there was one other thing can't remember and the attractive woman did that with the man right and they gave the responses. So X number of men, you know, like 45% said they'd go out on a date. 55% said they'd go back to her room for sex, right? And among the women, uh, actually, and the men said things to her like, well, why do we have to wait till tonight? Right? <laughs> and the women said things like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and the women, the, the number, guess what the percentage of women was that agreed to go back to his room for sex? Zero. Oh, that's <laughs> so. encouraging. Yeah, uh, that okay. is. Actually, that's a wonderful segue here. It's a very wonderful question. How can we return to the time of respectful lady and gentleman relationships? And is it even possible? And I recall in your book, there's uh, some uh, 
university professors actually makes people go on dates. So that's yes. sort of related to that. Yeah. So I think the colleges have a big role here. Um, you know, they have kind of been, not kind of, they have been cheerleaders for the sexual revolution. There's a big sex week at Yale. Mm -hmm. um, other colleges have the same thing. They have um, displays of sex toys that, you know, and they, when my sister-in-law dropped my nephew off at college a few years ago, she went into the common room and she reached into a basket to take out a wrapped candy and got really embarrassed, as did her son, to realize it was a wrapped condom. Okay, So the, that's the atmosphere that the universities have created. Now, what I talk about in the book is a professor at Boston College uh, who decided she, she had a seminar where she learned that none of the seniors in her seminar had ever even been on a date. And so she decided to make dating part of the curriculum. And it has spread like wildfire. First of all, she is now the relationship guru at Boston College, Carrie Cronin. Everybody, people who don't even take her class come to her and ask advice. But the kids really loved it. And they spent a lot of time in class going over how difficult it is to make yourself vulnerable. And she made rules about, like, what is a date? So she said, first of all, it had to be over by 10 PM. You had to ask someone you were truly interested in, not just a friend. There could be no alcohol consumed on the date. And you couldn't see a movie, because that would not involve talking. So you could go out for dinner. You could go for a walk around the lake, anything like that. But and the kids were incredibly enthusiastic, and it has spread. She has now spoken on, I think, 70 college campuses um, to spread the word that, oh, there's this thing called dating, and everyone seems to enjoy it. So there's hope. One of the things I enjoy is when a, a speaker comes from out of town, and we, I think we wonder as a group if a local story has made it outside or a local. And I don't know if you're aware, were you familiar with a, a case on the Stanford campus where there was a rape charge and the woman was, uh, I think, un unconscious at the time and, and the judge was actually recalled in yeah. the most recent. I'd like to comment on that. Or did you, have you heard about it? I've heard about it. It's actually mentioned in my book. Um, this is something where I, I think the right um, has a tendency, some people on the right have a tendency to go wrong. They say, oh, you know, all these stories about rape on campus, it's just regretted sex, it's just exaggeration, it's just hysteria. So look, there is a tremendous amount of hysteria. There is a tremendous amount of misrepresentation and massaging of data to make it come out to be one in four or one in five, which is ridiculous. But there is a tremendous amount of really bad behavior going on, too, and rape. And it shouldn't surprise us. I mean, we conservatives know that if you change all the rules and you make drunken hookups the, the uh, social life of choice, that's going to be a golden opportunity for the worst guys. And that's what they've done. They prey on freshman women, who inexperienced, make, get them drunk, and there is rape. And this girl was passed out. And, uh, and he was caught in the act, which is very rare, because usually these things don't happen outside. This one did. Well, I think this was pretty easy. How do you feel about the transgender ideas that being pushed in elementary schools where young children are being asked, which gender do they feel like on any given day? So this is, um, this is another subject that I do talk about in Sex Matters. And I think that the transgender moment is the logical extension of the feminist argument that began in the 60s and 70s that all differences between men and women are socially constructed. And when you start from that premise, which is, has been proved to be wrong, but that never stops them, um, you then can easily get, or you have gotten anyway, I don't know if it's so easy, to the point where you say, um, well, so here, here's, here's um, actually what happened. So the, they, they claimed that there were no sex differences, and there are some awful stories in the book about how badly wrong that has taken us. But science caught up to them. You know, there are all these studies that have been done, both on humans and animals, in the last 50 years, showing that there are tremendous numbers of differences between men and women, right, and male and female. So what they did is they sneakily changed the terms. They said, OK, fine. there. Are there are differences between male and female. But there's this other thing called gender, and gender is purely subjective. So you can be, you can look anatomically female, but be 
a gendered male and vice versa and so on and it's a spectrum and of course now I think when you fill out applications for certain like tests mm -hmm. and things you or, or on Facebook or something they give you 57 choices of what your gender is um, and it's it is look it requires very sensitive handling um, I I would have to say because there are children who have gender dysphoria who, who are confused about their sexuality and they require careful sensitive therapy but uh, the mania that has seized our country to and Europe to say that people two and three and four year olds can tell you that they are the person of the opposite sex is crazy it's crazy for a number of reasons one children go through stages as I tell in the book, I myself, when I was a little girl, was a bit of a tomboy, and I wanted everyone to call me Timmy. <laughs> okay, I thought being a boy would be great. <laughs> and imagine if a little girl today were to say that. You know, would her parents be counseled by the, the, the school and by the doctors that if they, you know, don't encourage the child in this idea that she's going to be depressed and. Uh, you know, as it was, I grew out of it very quickly, and most kids who express this gender dysphoria, the vast majority grow out of it, especially after they go through puberty. But now we're doing this, you know, these crazy interventions where we block puberty with drugs and so on and so forth, and dress the ch child as the opposite sex, and cut their hair as the opposite sex. And that in itself is going to do tremendous damage. I could go on and on about this, and I, I will cut it short. It's all in the book. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> good, good promo. This is an economic question. I don't know if you even know the answer. But is it true? Someone wants to know, is it true that women in the US own most of the property? Or how would that even be calculated? Do you have a sense of that? So I don't know the answer to that. And I think it might be complicated by a few individuals, like you know Jeff Bezos and, and, and Bill <laughs> Gates and so forth. So I'm not sure how that would work out, but, uh, but women have 52% of the managerial positions in our society, and, and they are 80% of the veterinarians in school right now, and they're dominating many, many fields, and um, you know, good for them. But as I said, it is not good for anybody if men are falling behind, and they are. Yeah, I do that. This question is interesting. I don't know if enough time has elapsed for there to be an effect yet, but regarding Title IX and the development uh, came down from Betsy DeVos and others, but under her direction of reducing or invest reducing the or investigation of claims of rape by females on college campuses has that had an effect where rape could be defined as anything from regret the next morning or 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 other things like that, and and certainly at the at the detriment of of young men. So Betsy DeVos did change the rules, but um, many of the colleges um, have instituted them voluntarily. So they're no longer saying that they are complying with the government's guidance, which was issued under the Obama administration. They're saying they're doing it voluntarily, so they're just going to ignore what the federal government says. And many states, including California, have passed laws that institutionalize or, or um, legislate those very same standards. So. It's good that the education department has backed off, but it's unclear to me how much good that will do at this point because it's got momentum. Oh, very sad here. Here's a, a name I hadn't heard in a long time, but the, qu the question wants to know, what impact do, would you place on the Kinsey Report? Remember that with contraception and, and all of the other kind of uh, social ills that grew out of that? This is a sneak question. Someone read the book and knows that I talk about the Kinsey Report. Oh, uh, yeah, so, um, so the Kinsey Report, the Height Report, um, a whole bunch of other things that were um, mainstream, even, um, even Dr. Spock. You know, a lot of these things have been shown. If they were to come out now, they would be completely debunked as junk science. Uh, Kinsey was a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> um, who filmed his um, uh, students having sex in his attic um, and uh, was into some very strange things himself. So he had a bit, and, and he used, he, he massaged his data in a very dishonest way. And um, so, but yet he is constantly cited as, um, as a mainstream scientist and somebody who changed America's conception of what was normal sexuality, and uh, it, it's gotten uh, very little attention in the years that have 
gone by uh, that it was not true. How to do that? This question is somewhat timely because of the uh, the nomination of of justice or Judge Kavanaugh, who is soon to be justice, and all the hysteria we've heard about uh, Roe versus Wade. Uh, Lincoln said that the nation could not endure half slave and half free, but if Roe and, and, and Roe versus Wade were overturned, is there a way that states would sort this out, that there'd be some, some federal level and some at the state level? Yes. Um, I, I think in all likelihood that we are headed into an era that I wasn't sure that I would ever see, which is um, that the Congress will actually, the Congress and the state legislatures and the people will have to make some tough decisions rather than handing it off to nine lawyers in the Supreme Court and saying, you do it. Mm -hmm. And that will be a very healthy thing for our country and for our democracy. People will have to make up their minds. I bet you there are going to be plenty of Republicans who will be towers of jello on this, <laughs> who um, have been campaigning and fundraising for decades about overturning Roe v. Wade, but when the opportunity presents itself, they may sort of get cold feet when they realize that it would be very unpopular. So it's going to be an interesting fight, and states will differ. And I think that is what the founders intended. And uh, I think it will be, as I say, a very welcome uh, bit of cleansing. Yes, that's, that's great. Thank you. So here's a little tongue in cheek here. If all differences between sexes is socially constructed, shouldn't men and women's sports be merged? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's not fair. Um, I, I had a little fun in the book talking about the battle of the sexes from the 1970s where Billie Jean King played Bobby Riggs, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. And they had, you know, this big anniversary of it and NBC or ABC, I think it was, were going on and on about how this changed the world. It changed everything. I said, changed the world? It didn't even change tennis. <laughs> I mean, men still only play men and women still play each other. I wonder why. Well, I mean, Billie Jean King was the, what was she, like the three-time champion. She was in her prime, and she was playing this washed-up guy who was about 15 mm -hmm. years or 20 years her senior. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even then, there were stories that maybe he threw them out. I don't know. But uh, he had defeated Margaret Court the, like, right before him. But in any event, um, she would never have challenged or dared to challenge the reigning male champion of Wimbledon for, for her year. It would be ridiculous. And you know, these kinds of things, look, if the feminists want to be taken seriously and want us to, re to, to, to uh, appreciate how smart they are, they might start by not arguing about stupid things like, are men stronger than women? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. In fact, if I remember correctly, apropos tennis, didn't one of the Williams sisters make a statement to that effect and got all kinds of garbage yep, from she it? Did. So, she, so, she said, yeah, this, just yeah, that. Mm -hmm. they just to do that. Good for her, by yeah, the way. Yeah, no kidding. Well, that's been great. Um, please help me thank Mona Charon one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.